Welcome to another edition of You Can Farm Talks. This is a live video podcast series where we talk with people in the agriculture industry who share important and relevant information with insights for new and beginning farmers and ranchers. These are short and focused conversations that generally last about 20 to 30 minutes. First, we ask our guests to share their story in agriculture, and then we ask them to talk about one thing that they think someone getting started in agriculture needs to know. For those of you tuning into the live Zoom feed, we hope you'll submit questions in the chat window. As we get to the end, I'll try to pick out a question to ask our guest. All of these shows are recorded and posted online on our webpage, where you'll also find an online discussion forum. You can ask questions in the forum anytime and we'll respond to additional questions there that we don't get to during the live episode. Our guest today is Casey Crosby. Casey grew up on a farm and ranch in Northern Wyoming. From a young age, he learned from his dad how to irrigate, handle livestock, and work long hours. Casey graduated from BYU with a bachelor's in agribusiness and later went back and received his MBA, graduating from BYU in 2008. Upon graduation, the 2008 financial crisis was hitting the country. This opened an opportunity to buy a farm close to home using cows he had bought from his dad a few years before as a down payment. It was a roll of the dice, but 15 years later, he and his wife, Julia, have expanded their farm and ranch interests to include several thousand acres of farm and ranch ground. His farming interests include alfalfa, grass, canola, and dry beans, all for seed, sugar beets, barley and barley seed, corn, and oats. His ranching interests are primarily a cow-calf operation on high desert ground spanning the Wyoming-Montana border. Julia and Casey have three children, Annie, 13, Kate, 11, and Luke, 9. They all enjoy working on the farm and ranch and spending time supporting the kids in the various sports and extracurricular activities. Casey, we always start off this conversation by giving our guests a chance to talk about their own story in agriculture. Please tell me about those first few years after you purchased the farm close to your home at the time. I know that those first few years can often be stressful. Please tell us a bit about your background, how you got to this point in your life and career, and maybe talk a little more about how and why you've chosen to become directly involved in agriculture, as well as in, as encouraging and mentoring other beginning farmers. Okay, well, there's a lot to it, and we don't have a lot of time, but I'll kind of go through a few things. I went to school knowing that I wanted to uh, be part of agriculture. I'd love just to do farming and ranching full time but I didn't know quite how to make that work. So I went and got my education in agribusiness, kind of kind of feeling it out. I started buying some cows for my dad um, and my brother and I were running them together, kind of figuring that I'd get a job full time and then I'd have these cows on the side. At one point I thought about becoming an appraiser. My brother was doing appraisals, farm and ranch appraisals. So I thought maybe doing that. But then when I graduated with my MBA, this um, this farm came up for sale, and I thought I'd roll the dice on it, uh, got my brother to sign with me on it, and then uh, got the FSA to uh, give me all the money I needed to to kind of, uh, I don't know, to, to have the operating line to work on it. And then from there, I wasn't quite sure what to do, but I decided – I decided at that point to start growing hay seed and alfalfa seed and and doing cow calf operation and from there that's kind of where we went kind of tough going at the beginning i had to uh, rent all my equipment for my dad and then um slowly rent equipment kind of got going there growing more alfalfa seed uh and yeah i've kind of grown from there a few years ago oh it's been several years ago now I expanded both farm and uh, ranch side quite a bit, bought out an older farmer um, and uh, to the point where we grow quite a bit uh, of alfalfa seed and um, 
and do sugar beets in a big way, do quite a bit of barley, quite a bit of seed crops, and then, uh, yeah, got up to uh, doing quite a few more cows, and that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. All the time kind of reinventing ourselves depending on how things are going, but yeah, uh, if there was two things, well, the biggest things I do right now are sugar beets, alfalfa seed, and cows. Those are the, that's the biggest things, but I do uh, quite a few acres of grass seed and a few other things like that. So yeah, that's kind of, kind of my story. And I, and I also listed uh, grass seed and some of those other crops. And, and I know from some of my experience, alfalfa seed tends to be kind of cyclical. Is that, is that kind of part of your plan that, that you're able to move into other types of seed production when alfalfa seed acres go down? Yeah, alfalfa seed acres do are cyclical, but I kind of I keep a pretty good size footprint there. It's funny because I remember when I first bought my farm, um, a guy that I knew, a neighbor, a neighbor, neighboring farmer that I knew, his dad had passed away, and he said, "Well, my dad had been into hay seed. I took the truck, I took the a couple trucks of load uh, loads of hay seed in, and was able to pay the farm payment with it. My dad never did hay seed." But I thought at that time, I thought, well, gosh, if he can, if he can do that, I can do that. So I, I called around, found a guy that was doing it, asked him about it, got a contract kind of on a whim and started growing it. And, and then it's kind of a big part of what we do. Um, um, I grow a lot of alfalfa seed. That's, you know, um, and, and it does work up and down. But the, the reason I grow the grass seed is because it, it works with a good rotation. You grow hay seed in a field for three or four years, you need a good rotation to go back into it. Sometimes beets is, and barley's that rotation. Sometimes the ground is better to have as like a, a grassy contract that's another three years. And then you roll that back into alfalfa seed. Luckily right now we're on the upswing with alfalfa seed. And that's something I, a lot of producers aren't uh, as comfortable with outside of let's say sugar beets uh, outside of that area in Wyoming, contract production isn't something that's, that's very common. Can you, could you tell us how that changes, how you look at your operation uh, contracting for a lot of, a lot of what you do? Oh, you know, the contracting is, isn't a problem. Actually it lowers the risk threshold because you got to, you got your price contract and then you just have, so you take price risk out of the mix and then you just go with, uh, with, um, production risk. There's a lot of production risk. I remember the, um, the, oh, one of the, one of the local, um, ag advisors at the time trying to talk me out of even doing hayseed because there was so much production risk associated with it because you're, you're doing both a, you're, you're managing the bees that, that pollinate the alfalfa seed and you're actually, and you're managing the plant producing it. So there's a lot of risk that goes with it, but uh, you know, you gotta, if you want to get anywhere, you got to take some risks and it worked out. It worked out. Um, it's counter cyclical. So when beans and corn are kind of, kind of having a little bit more trouble price wise, alfalfa seed seems to do a little better so it works out well and maybe alfalfa seed isn't the thing for everybody and it's not it kind of so much depends on your area and where you're at and a few other things uh, for me it works but somebody else can find their own alfalfa seed whatever that might be maybe that's canola seed or maybe it's um, maybe it's something else but um, but the thing about it is is to get to get get a start, you kind of need to figure out a niche that works for you. Um, if you are trying to compete with with, I knew I couldn't compete with corn farmers in the Midwest. Let's put it that way. I knew that wasn't going to work, and I knew I wasn't going to be the biggest stalker yearling guy around. So I needed to figure out a niche that worked for me. And I guess everybody kind of needs to figure it out. If I had tried to just do beets and barley like my dad was doing, which worked for him, but if I tried to do that, I knew I couldn't cash flow that because I couldn't afford starting out and buying the equipment to make that work. So I had to figure out something that worked for me. Thanks for 
sharing your story. I think it's always helpful for our listeners to hear about how someone like yourself found their path and to share their story. So as we talked about, the main purpose of this video podcast is to ask our guests to share something we call their one thing. In other words, we want them to tell us about one thing that they think new and beginning farmers really need to know or keep in mind be thinking about or doing as they're in the beginning stages and getting ready to take on their own challenge of starting an agriculture operation. I know that you have some thoughts to share with us and our audience of ag entrepreneurs about finding people and the items you consider essential in pursuing success in production agriculture, finding mentors and examples that are successful in the enterprises that interest you and learning from those people how to manage risk. So Casey, please tell us about the one thing that you want to share with our new and beginning producers today. Okay. So, you know, it's always hard to boil it down to one thing, but if I was going to say, hey, this is one piece of advice that I want to give new and beginning producers. I remember sitting in an ag class. It was my first ag class, uh, my first year, first semester at college. And so, you know, you're pretty timid anyway. You're sitting there at the ag center and the college president came in to speak to us. And it was interesting because he was very dynamic, this college president. He came in and he sat us down. This was uh, what used to be Rick's College. It's BYU-Idaho now. And I did two years there, my associate's degree there. Anyway, he came down he, and he talked to us. And and uh, and then he said, hey, are there any questions? And, uh, of course, you know, I heard no way I was going to ask any questions. I was a little freshman and nobody else really thought about asking questions. He's like, you know, he kind of scolded us. And he said, you know, guys. I don't sit around, I, I meet with a lot of important people and I don't just sit there waiting for them to distill upon me all their knowledge. He's like, just the other day, and he named the guy, he's like, I was I was on a plane ride with this guy and he was the wheeler and dealer in, in his world. And he said, I didn't just sit next to this guy on this plane waiting for him to tell me everything he knew that I needed to know. He said, I... I've learned that to be successful, you need to ask good questions from, from the best people. And so he said, if you want to learn how to become a good plumber, you need to go out and find the best plumber you know and ask him how he's made it work. He said, if you want to be a good carpenter, you go learn from the best carpenter you can find. And, and that, that advice has stuck with me since, and it, it applies to my world. So when I start, started on my own, um, I found the best person and persons I could find in the alfalfa seed world, in, the, in whatever it was I was trying to do, and I asked them questions. In agriculture, it's so unforgiving. There's so much capital you put out, and, uh, and, and, the, mar and the risk is high, and, and, and boy, if you mess up, even one year starting out, it can bury you. You just don't, just won't have the, you just won't have what it takes to keep going. And so financially, and so asking somebody else how to do it, not trying to reinvent the wheel, boy, that really saved me. And so, for example, how to incubate bees. It's a whole process. It's a very complicated and, and sensitive process. And if you don't, if, if you have the temperature wrong on your incubators on the wrong day for six hours, you can you can wreck your whole bees. And so when I'm incubating bees, I'm incubating six to seven hundred thousand dollars worth of bees. And if I mess that up, man, that's a big deal. And so when you do asking somebody else how to do it saves saved me a lot of problems. So I guess if there was one advice I would do. It would be it would be that if I was going to tack on maybe another little thing, and um, I was telling Keith this, um, I you know I was I was listening to a, an ag an ag guy talk about uh, an ag lender talk about a guy he had and he couldn't he couldn't um, he had a he had a a kid that had gotten all his late thirties he kind of got his farm 
farm payment. Uh, well, he was he didn't have a farm, but he was trying to. He had his machinery all paid for, his house all paid for, and um, and he just couldn't afford the farm ground to um, to to farm. And so they were complaining about how high farm ground was and how impossible it was for young and beginning producers to go out and 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 to get their foot in the door with farm ground. And I'll tell you what, that story has not ever changed. There was maybe a little window in the 1980s where maybe that maybe you could get farm ground cheap, I guess. I don't know. I wasn't I wasn't buying farm ground in the 1980s. But um, but basically ground has always been expensive when you bought it and it's always been cheap looking back and so if you're not willing to leverage yourself and take risk you're never going to be able to to get a foot in the door farm ground wise so those i guess uh you're just going to have to as a beginning farmer look at look for those guys who are doing it well and pump them for knowledge and then learn to have a good relationship with your bank and leverage yourself to be able to get your foot in the door. You mentioned that you had to lease equipment for a while. Do you have any suggestions about things to watch out for or ideas on how to best structure a lease agreement for equipment and or land when you're getting started? Boy, if, if I, I guess my advice would be uh, equipment is a necessary evil. Um, you know, you, you go out and you buy only what you have to buy to get started. I leased equipment for my dad. That was a great opportunity, but he didn't cut me any breaks. You know, I still had to lease the equipment at, at the going rate. Um, I mean, he, he helped me. Um, he helped me in that respect because he gave me the opportunity there, but I still had to lease it at the going rate that was, whatever it was, you know, whatever we decided on there. And, but spend your money on the ground. You know, you go, you, I always remember a, um, a friend of mine whose dad had the choice of buying one, of, uh, you know, expanding the equipment line in his dairy or buying some bottom river bottom ground. All that equipment that the, he decided to do the equipment, all that equipment is, sitting in a heap somewhere worthless now at this point and that river bottom ground has has appreciated a thousand times since that he passed up on um i i think the best thing you can do as you start out is is spend as little as money as you can on equipment you know you have to still run you still have to have equipment that makes makes the the whole operation go but don't spend any more money than you have to and sink as much money as you can't invest as much money as you can into into the real estate because it will always money spent on real estate is always an investment money spent on equipment is always an expense so yeah i don't know if i answered that question but that's sure you suggested leveraging when when you first got started, I suspect you're talking about with a commercial lender and or I, I think you also mentioned FSA. Any insights on how to structure a loan when you're just getting started? Recommendations on what you want to avoid? That's a great question. Wyoming has some great things for beginning producers. You know, they I use the Wyoming's beginning producer I uh, can't remember it all now. It's been a while ago, but they they have some great, you know, you need to get with your banker. You need to have a relationship. You need to have a good bank and a good person that you can go to. But there are some great, um, both federal through the FSA and, and state through the state of Wyoming that can help you lower your interest rates on your loans, um, get some loans that maybe don't have a lot of collateral. Because that was my problem. I didn't have a lot of collateral. I had my cows that could secure my real estate note, but I didn't have any collateral to secure my operating line. Um, and so, um, uh, and so when I went on my own and uh, uh, that first year, my brother kind of helped me, but after that, I need to figure out a way to, to get my operating line going. And so I went through the FSA on the operating line and they took no, 
they didn't they didn't require any collateral for that. And so, you know, there's some good things out there. There's a lot of things out there. Um, NRCS it is fantastic for beginning producers. I used a lot of NRCS money to help because my infrastructure, my, my farm, when I bought my farm, it was a fixer upper. I remember going around with the real estate guy. Uh, it was it was crazy. The bank the bank was was getting closed down by the government because of the financial crisis. Uh, First National Bank in Powell, which I loved, had uh, some major problems. So they got bought, bought out by Glacier. And Glacier was, you know, it was really putting the screws to them. So they had to get, there was kind of a fire sale. I remember going around with the bank, the, the realtor at the time, and the weeds, the kosher weeds on this farm were five feet, six feet, 10 feet, 20 feet tall. I mean, you know, it was really bad. It was a fixed rubber. So I needed some money to improve the irrigation system to grow the crops that I needed to to pay the payment. And RCS was a great opportunity. Um, there's a lot of things out there for beginning farmers that can really help you get a start. Casey, thanks a lot for talking with us today. We really appreciate your taking the time to share your insights and experiences for the benefit of new and beginning farmers. So with that, thanks so much for spending part of your evening with us during a very busy time of the year. Yeah, my pleasure. That will do it for this episode of You Can Farm Talks. Thanks to those of you who took the time to join this live discussion and submit questions. The recording of this episode and all our previous episodes will be posted and archived on our website and on our YouTube page. If you have any more questions, or if you're watching the recorded episode and didn't get a chance to ask them, please feel free to send questions via email or even better by adding them to the online discussion forum. We will try to respond to as many questions as we can and share the answers below. Stay tuned for information about the next You Can Farm Talks conversation. We'll be sharing details about who our next guest will be and when the episode will take place soon. Check back on our You Can Farm website and Facebook page. Funding for this program has been provided by the USDA NEFA BFRDP program. We'd also like to thank Custom Ag Solutions, Right Risk, and our, especially our partners at University of Wyoming Extension. And we'd especially like to thank Casey Crosby for joining us tonight. Thanks for listening to You Can Farm Talks.